OK, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Um, so just uh, one announcement that the uh, fifth assignment is posted. It's due on uh, 3rd of December. And um, I've used that assignment uh, specifically to pull together the topics of liquid extraction, drying, this topic we're starting today, as well as adsorption. And I've chosen questions from all prior exams. So that gives you a good practice for that, uh, that level of capability. Um, 3rd of December is also the last class that we will meet together here. So that assignment is due that day, um, and no late hand-ins are possible, obviously, with that. Also, because the exam is on the 9th of December, I'll post the solutions pretty much straight away that day. Um, so submit your assignment on the 3rd, either electronically or here in class on that last day. Any, um, any questions or concerns? Okay, so we're starting this, uh, this topic of drying, and drying is a way that we can start to bring um, energy balances, mass balances. We're really stepping up the level of complexity here with, uh, with the separation because we've got both these mechanisms of mass transfer as well as heat transfer taking place. So there's a good number of references here for you um, to look at. One that's freely available to you and really good to read is the article from Ullman's Encyclopedia. That link works on campus and you can get the PDF for that. Perry's as well, the, the link that's shown over there um, works on campus and as you know, you have free access to that handbook here um, when, you, when you download it on campus. So make sure that you, you read some background reading if you need a bit more information. But um, let's just give a little bit of context of, of this topic here. We're looking at drying of solid products in this topic. Um, we're not looking at evaporators. Um, per se, evaporators, which would be looking at, at cooling um, a liquid phase, but we're looking at drying a solid product here. Um, and that's done by adding this energy separating agent, the thermal energy. Now, I find it confusing that some textbooks cover the topic of drying early on. Like it's in, I think in Giancopolis, it's one of the first topics that's c considered. And it makes no sense to me because in terms of complexity, it's bringing energy and mass transfer to combined. Um, it also makes sense to look at it near the end of a course because what you'll see is that on a flow sheet it's pretty much one of the last steps as well. Just so from a conceptual um, point of view, as we know from our prior uh, course, uh, right from the first class, I believe we looked at the fact that most processes are made up of a majority of separators. 70% and some processes as much as 95 to 100% are just pure separators. And so you'll find your drying stage right at the end. In particular, pharmaceutical um, systems. If you walk into a pharmaceutical manufacturing facility, the device that looks like the tumble dryer at home is their dryer. It's no, no, no surprise that it looks like that because it does exactly the same thing. It just tumbles all the pills around and dries it that way. Food. Um, food, we have a very specific need for drying. I'll talk about it here in a minute. Grains, cereal products, for the same reason as, as regular foods have this requirement for drying. Lumber, pulp, and paper products. Um, paper is very specifically dried to get exactly the right texture and the ca characteristics of being able to write on it. Um, if you dry it more or less, you get different types of papers. Um, and Lumber as well for that reason is dried. Sorry, not for that reason. Lumber is also dried to get a specific, um, specific mass for shipping. Right? You don't want to ship water around if you don't have to. So we'll, we'll prefer to dry the lumber and, and spend less money on shipping. Cat, cat, catalysts and fine chemicals, they have very specific requirements. If you remember back to your chemistry courses, certain molecules have like a dot .5 H2O and a dot .2 H2O. Right, and with drying, we'll vary it um, from one of those numbers to another number. So we typically dry for a number of reasons, but the most important often is that it just is easier to work with a drier product than a wet product. Right? It's easier to package, it's cheaper to ship. Um, packaging is really, really difficult on a moist product, and so we prefer uh, dry. 
if we're dealing with foods, moisture will encourage bacterial growth. And so if we want to um, prolong that shelf life, we would want to make sure that all the moisture is dried off or as much as we can. And I'll show you an interesting plot that, that helps guide us with that in a minute. It also, um, as I said, it's much easier to package a dry product. And one of the reasons for that is it um, flows better. Right? So a, a stickier product won't move so easily. But the other interesting reason why we would like to dry food products is to get a desired property. Right? If you think, of, let me, uh, maybe you've, you've, you certainly have experienced this. If you've put a piece of bread in a toaster and you've toasted it, and then you've forgotten about it and then come back later and then you eat that toast, what is it? It's kind of like overly dry, right? And you eat it and it's, it's like buying that snack bread from Ikea, that extremely crispy European bread, right? And you, you bite into it, your whole head vibrates, kind of, right? So that, but there's certain foods where that's a desired pro property, right? You wouldn't want to open a bag of Doritos and they're all soggy. That would be very unsatisfying. So when food companies look at their products, there's a very narrow window of dryness that they're looking for. Right? And it's all very scientific. Then they, when they develop those products, they do actually measure the vibrations set up in your jawbone and in your skull. And that creates a various characteristics of desirability. So there's a, those properties have a specific name. They're called organoleptic properties. And Food, any beverage, uh, sorry, any food-based industry, any product that you're consuming, um, you'll be looking at the organoleptic properties. And one of the key determinants of the, that organoleptic property is the dryness. So for those reasons, we would dry. If you're dealing with products that involve any sort of metal, uh, we have a corrosion triangle. So the corrosion triangle is much like the fire triangle. The corrosion triangle, you require a metal, corrodent, and moisture. So if you remove one of those three from the system, you don't get corrosion. So if we remove moisture and just leave metal and the corrodent there, we won't get corrosion. Um, so your corrodent could be something like uh, an acid, for example. So we would, we would dry for a number of those reasons there. So let's take a look at this plot. This plot tells us what happens at a specific temperature with various products. What is what does that plot remind you of? What does it look, look like? No guesses? Joseph? The isotherm from adsorption, okay? So in, in some of these regions, so if we take cotton, at least initially it looks like an isotherm. Wood and leather, they look more like the Freundlich isotherm that we saw earlier on. In these regions down here, they're very much linear, so we could use a linear approximation. These are exactly isotherms, um, but for a different material. So rather than, say, activated carbon, we're looking at an isotherm here for cotton. And if we plot one of these up, let's just take a, look, a little bit more of a deeper look at this. We've got on the horizontal axis relative humidity. Relative humidity is a percent moisture. Okay? And we'll look at how we can get that. Remember in the isotherm, we were looking at units that were grams of solute per meter cubed of fluid. Right? So replace that with grams of water per meter cubed of air, and you've got exactly the same idea. Um, except relative humidity looks at taking those units more to a percentage basis, and I'll get you there in a few minutes. We'll, we'll see how that's done. But essentially, that's what your horizontal axis is, and your vertical axis is very explicit over there. It's exactly the same as we saw earlier. It's kilograms of water per 100 kilograms of material. Okay, so if we look at the isotherm for cotton, we'll see a shape that looks something like that. Okay, so this tells you what's going to happen to your shirt that you take out of your dryer and you hang on the clothesline. Eventually, you're going to get to equilibrium and you're going to be somewhere on this curve. 
right? This is the equilibrium curve. So let's perhaps look at that on a, in a, on a day where there's a low amount of relative humidity. You're going to end up with that much water per 100 kilograms of material. On a day with high humidity, you're going to be somewhere over here. Okay, so it tells you at equilibrium how much moisture is going to be remaining on that, that, on that cotton. If you take it out of the dryer, when you, um, you just remove it out of the dryer, it's coming out at some very high number on this axis, right? So there's a lot of moisture on that, that shirt or that, that garment you're taking out of the dryer. And let's say the day is, is over here. It's a day where there's a relative humidity of about 25%. Okay, so you take it out of your dryer. It's, you hang it up. The, the air outside is 25% relative humidity. That's your starting point. And you're going to end up over there eventually. It may take a few hours for that shirt to dry, but that's your equilibrium point. Okay, if the day is a more humid day, if it's rainy outside, you're going to start at the same point. Your dryer doesn't get affected by the humidity outside, so you start at the same point and it will end up over there. If you touch that fabric at, on a humid day, it, it has a little bit of a clammy feel sometimes as well, and it will certainly take longer to dry because there's a, a smaller driving force, right? The driving force is, is a little bit less. So what we, what we use then is, um, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that a little bit here. Um, that's your equilibrium point. If you start off over there, that's your total point. And what we, what we call is a point that's on this curve. So between here and there, that's your bound moisture. So this, and when you start up over there, that's, your unbound moisture. And the reason for those two names are related to the thinking that the unbound moisture is in excess of what can be bound on the cotton. So if you think of that pretty much like an adsorbent, so we've got adsorbent particles here, right? You're going to have moisture molecules that have, I'm going to use quotation marks, adsorbed onto the cotton or onto the solid phase, right? So if you've got, that's your equilibrium amount of moisture that can be carried by that particular material. And then if you wet it, then you've got excess moisture there, that's unbound moisture. But at equilibrium, that moisture is bound, that amount of moisture, that distance, is the amount of moisture that's bound or adsorbed if you want to see it in that. It's not a true way of seeing it. It's not truly adsorbed, but it gives you an idea of what's going on. Okay, and our, um, we're going to end up there at equilibrium. Now, if we're looking at food packaging, um, if we go back to one of these, okay, none of them are foods, um, but if we did have an uh, isotherm for a type of food, you can see why when you buy something like Doritos or snack food that it comes in a sealed bag. So if we plot, let's draw up a fictitious isotherm for potato chips, might look like that. And it might be that the manufacturer has determined that the optimal crispiness is at that sort of level over there. So that much kilograms of water per 100 kilogram of chips, okay? If they shipped the potato chips to you in an open bag and it, you lived in a humid climate, those potato chips would adsorb the excess moisture and equilibrate to that level of moisture per 100 kilograms of chips, okay? So what they do is they'll dry in the factory the material to that level of moisture and ship it to you in a closed bag. And that's why when you open the bag, you consume it fairly quickly before they go soggy. Right? So 
it's an equilibrium curve. That's what I, what I want you to get from it. Now, I also want you to understand why we need to put heat in to dry material. It seems obvious. Well, it may kind of like, why, why would you even ask this question? Why do you need to add heat to dry off material? But let's take a look at it a little bit from a thermodynamic perspective. So I'll draw another isotherm over here. And let's look at it back at adsorption. There was a slide. I skipped over it, but it, we can cover it over here. If we're starting with a point over here, so here's my, my starting point. So you've got an adsorbent or you've got a material that doesn't have the equilibrium amount of moisture. It's below its equilibrium amount. Okay. We know that if I'm in an environment with this amount of humidity and I start at this point, I'm going to end up over there. Okay. I don't have to do anything. I just, let's say these are potato chips, I just open the bag and seemingly by magic, a few hours later, they've become a little soggier. They've automatically moved up to that equilibrium. Like, I've done nothing. Okay? And we know from thermodynamics, when something like that happens without us doing anything, that delta G must be negative. Right? Nothing happens unless delta G is negative. So that must have, that must have been the case. Well, let's just take a look at a little bit at delta G. Delta G is equal to minus delta H plus T delta S. Okay. So what, what happens when we're going from this point to this point is we're getting water molecules attaching onto that solid surface. When those water molecules attach to the surface, we're getting more order into the system. Right? It must be that the entropy has also decreased. Right? It must have because the moisture, instead of hanging around in the atmosphere, is now actually attached to the solid. We're getting a little bit more order to the system, and so the entropy has gotten negative. If we rearrange that equation here, we we're talking about heat, remember. I want to, to get to explain to you why heat is required. Well, if we rearrange for delta H, let's see. Delta H is equal to delta G plus T times delta S now. Okay. So if delta G is negative and delta S is negative and temperature is in the Kelvin scale, so we're always at zero or above, it implies that delta H is also negative. Okay? So going from here to here in this direction, we've actually released heat. It wasn't something I explicitly mentioned to you during the adsorption section, but when we're adsorbing onto an adsorbent, we release heat. A small amount, but there's heat released. Okay? Which explains then when you want to go the other way, when you want to go this direction, you need to add heat to get that to happen. So we'll find that going up at least to the equilibrium line, we don't need to add anything. Right? It happens spontaneously and a little bit of heat is released for us. It's almost like a little bit of a chemical reaction. This material comes and attaches to the surface and because it's become more ordered, more, a little bit of heat's released. But if we want to do the opposite, we have to add heat. Okay? If you want to regenerate your adsorbent to reuse it again, you have to add heat. Right? So when you regenerate your adsorbent, you move from there back down. Okay? That's why I cover this topic after adsorption. It makes no sense to cover it earlier on because we need to have that understanding first. Okay, so is that thermodynamic perspective a little clearer? Okay, so it explains something that we intuitively know um, and, and matches up with our expectation. Okay, so let's take a look at what's, what's going on when we dry a solid. We know, yes? Uh, sorry, to go back to your uh, diagram, the there. Yeah. Um, is the bound moisture just the region underneath the curve? Because uh, in, in your slide diagram, the bound moisture and uh, that whole region and equilibrium moisture content uh, there, like, like, are they the same? Or, 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 I just don't understand the diagram. 
Right. Uh, bound moisture, you can consider just the mass of moisture that's attached to the solid. So over here, I've got whatever that value is on the y-axis. Let's say it's 5 kilograms per 100 kilograms of solid. 5 kilograms of the moisture is bound. If I move to over here, there's a, a greater percentage of moisture that's bound to the solid. So it's just like what you would read off on the... the exactly, the vertical axis, yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at the two, the two um, mechanisms happening here. In drying, we've got both mass and heat transfer. Now, let's take a look at the mass transfer first. The mass transfer is got to happen so that that moisture moves from the interior of the solid to the outer surface. So remove that molecule of water there. So that moisture is trapped inside. We have to provide enough um, energy, and we're going to just look at the heat transfer aspect in a minute, but we have to bring that liquid from the interior to the outside. So this liquid has to come up and almost kind of spread itself or coat itself over the surface. Um, and then our next step is to vaporize that liquid from the liquid phase to the vapor phase. And what we're going to want to do as well, rather than build up this vapor right there at the surface, we want to get that vapor away. Right? We want to move that vapor away so we can get more mass transfer occurring. We don't want to build this vapor up close to the surface. Right? So it's the reason also why clothes dry better when on a windier day, because you're getting that moisture moving away from the, the fabric and allowing more vapor to come in Sorry, you're allowing more vapor to enter there and replace the vapor that's been pulled away. So three mechanisms. Bring the liquid out from the interior to the surface, coat the surface and have it vaporize, and then get that vapor away so that you can keep driving that mass transfer forward. Now, where does all that energy come from? Well, the, the energy to do that comes from the environment itself. So this is going to happen in some sort of environment and this air temperature is going to drop. So the energy required to do that must come from the environment. The temperature in that environment will drop. We know that a tremendous amount of heat is required to take water from its liquid phase to the vapor phase. That heat of vaporization is, is, isn't a small number. So that temperature here will drop down to do that. Okay, so we're going to have to keep supplying that heat to keep the material evaporating. Now, that heat goes to two places, one of which is to vaporize the, li the liquid. Some of it will also enter the solid, right? So we're going to heat our solid up as well. Um, we can't tell the heat where to go. The heat will also heat the solid as well, and we call that sensible heat. The heat of vaporization, delta H vap, as you know, is also sometimes referred to as latent heat. Okay, latent meaning hidden. You don't. Okay, so it's an adiabatic system. At least our consideration will be that we're considering a closed volume that heat is supplied by the temperature decrease. Okay, and heat of vaporization varies at different temperatures. So it's a slightly higher requirement to vaporize water at low temperatures than at a higher temperature. And you can interpolate linearly between that very safely. Um, now, the other thing we have to understand is a phase diagram. The phase diagram reminds us of some important principles in the system. We're going to look at that first. The most important idea that we get from a phase diagram, this is a recap of some basic chemistry, is the idea of partial pressure. Sorry, not of partial pressure, of vapor pressure. Um, let me just uh, illustrate that here. We've got temperature on the horizontal axis and pressure on the vertical axis. And we've got some lines that we're concerned about here, the, the one of which is this arc, and two points um, that we're interested in. There's our boiling point. I'm going to just look uh, at um, atmospheric 
So we're here at one atmosphere for now. Okay, and at atmospheric, we've also got this vertical line, our freezing point. Okay, so the vapor pressure at 100 degrees Celsius, what we get from this curve is the vapor pressure. The vapor pressure at 100 degrees Celsius is one atmosphere. So let's perhaps note that up here. Vapor pressure at one atmosphere sorry I should say vapor pressure is one atmosphere at 100 degrees Celsius what you notice is that if we go to let's just zoom in a little bit here if we go to lower temperatures that the vapor pressure decreases. So let's take this number that's roughly at about 50. We follow it up and over. So if we go up at 50 degrees, we hit that curve and then go over, we get a vapor pressure that's about 10 kPa. So if we were here at 50 degrees Celsius, we come across we get 10 kPa. So it's a one-tenth reduction by changing 50 degrees down. So vapor pressure is 10 kPa at about 50 degrees Celsius. Okay, why, do I, why am I mentioning that? Well, we have to understand the balance of the pressures in a system when we're drying. Right? We, this is going to be critical to our understanding, so I'm recapping some basic uh, chemistry and engineering concepts here. When we're drying, we have two pressures being balanced against each other. There's the vapor pressure, okay. and we have in the air, we're going to have moisture. There's already moisture in the air. And the amount of moisture in the air, the mole fraction multiplied by the total pressure, gives me the partial pressure. Okay, so partial pressure, you remember back from chemistry. Let's do, it's a quick recap. If you've got, say, two species in the, in the vapor phase, you take the mole fraction of the one species, the mole fraction of the other species, multiply the mole fraction by the total pressure, and you get the partial pressure. And the sum of the partial pressures adds up to the total pressures. Okay, so the reason why I'm referring to this is we've got air and we've got water. Typically, that's going to be our system. So if I've got water in the air, if I've got a high partial pressure, do I have a high humidity or low humidity? High humidity. So the higher the humidity, the higher the partial pressure. So that's just um, something to remember. So higher humidity implies high partial pressure. Okay. And we said earlier that if we're drying clothes on a day where there's a high humidity, we're going to have a tougher time doing it. Right? There's a lower driving force doing that. Right? It makes intuitive sense as well. On a day that's extremely humid outside, it's going to take a long time to dry those clothes. Okay, So a high humidity is, another way of saying that, is there's a high partial pressure. There's a high amount of moisture in the air. Well, the requirement, and this is where I'm going with this, the requirement to evaporate material, uh, evaporate water, is simple. To evaporate, we must have the vapor pressure must exceed the partial pressure. Okay. 
So on a day with high humidity, you've got high partial pressure. Okay. That means to get evaporation happening on a day with high humidity, you're going to re require more vapor pressure. Right? Because you only get evaporation happening when vapor pressure exceeds partial pressure. So if your partial pressure is high already, you need to provide an even higher still vapor pressure. Okay, well, where does vapor pressure come from? We have to add that to our system. Right? This material that leaves the surface of the, of the solid and goes into the vapor, that energy that it gets comes from the system itself. So in order to get a higher vapor pressure, we're going to have to add more temperature, more energy, to get the vapor pressure higher than the partial pressure. So we're bringing a lot of concepts from chemistry, from 2D, 2F, from thermo that you've learned before but may have um, not really recalled so, so readily. Okay, so make sure that those concepts make sense to you. We have to understand them very well. Now, vapor pressure is, again, it's a number that's given in pressure units. So let's just take a look a little bit at that. Partial pressure is the easy one to understand, right? It's just related to the mole fraction times the total pressure. But vapor pressure is a little, a little unfamiliar sometimes. Vapor pressure, let's take a look at, again back at these two numbers. At one at, is one atmosphere when we're at 100 degrees Celsius. So at a higher temperature, I get a higher vapor pressure. At a lower temperature, 50 degrees Celsius, my vapor pressure drops off. Okay, so we're seeing that reflected there. And it's an intuitive understanding we have. If I take water at 50 degrees versus it's got a lower vapor pressure, water at 50 degrees is not going to just go and vaporize by itself. Certainly not as readily as water at 100 degrees. Water at 100 degrees is right at the boiling point, And so it's readily... It's got a very, very high vapor pressure, easily exceeds the partial pressure, and will go into the vapor phase very quickly for us. And we'll, we'll, we'll get what our goal is. Our goal is to evaporate. Okay. Another term that's often used for vapor pressure is volatility. So volatility, you've heard like alcohol is more volatile than water. Right? That's something that you know. What does that mean? All it, if alcohol is more volatile than water, it means that alcohol has a higher vapor pressure than water, okay, which means it will evaporate because the vapor pressure exceeds the partial pressure. Okay, so er anyone unclear with those terms? At, at, if you take water and alcohol at, at the same temperature, say 50 degrees Celsius, so 50 degrees Celsius alcohol and 50 degrees Celsius water, alcohol has a higher volatility. A higher volatility is saying the same thing as a higher vapor pressure. So al alcohol, you'll see your alcohol disappear a lot faster than water, right? which is why, I mean, distillation is, that's the principle there of distillation. The partial pressure of of the material being evaporated. That's true. There's not a lot of alcohol in the vapor either. But we'll also show in a minute that water in is not readily held in the atmosphere, right? Um, it's a very very low mass of water per mass of air in the vapor. But you're right. Absolutely, the partial pressure of alcohol in the air is zero. Typically, okay. So let's um, let's um, move on a little bit. There's some of that terminology I just introduced as text. We don't need to go through it again. Um, the key is that moisture will evaporate from a solid only when the vapor pressure exceeds the partial pressure, and we can get that vapor pressure high by raising the heat of the solid. So there's the the general conclusions I want you to take from that. Otherwise, if those terms are still not familiar to you, please. Uh, refer back to a chemistry textbook or some resources. Okay, so now we're going to look at this chart, which I know that you know. 
And um, we're going to have to recap it though a little bit because it's probably been a while since you looked at it. So I have hundreds of these here for you. Please feel free to take two handouts. Uh, there's, they're copied on both sides so you get lots of opportunity to practice and work with these. The whole section relies on this, this chart and so we have to come to a good understanding of what's going on in here. Let's take some more. So take two copies and pass them around. some more if you just want to pass that one Okay, so let's just do a quick recap. Look at the plot in front of you and I, tell me what is the, the most moisture we can hold in air that is 20 degrees. Anyone got a number? Yeah. Okay, so a very small amount, 150 grams of water can be held by air at 20, by one kilogram of air at 20 degrees Celsius. Okay. So you do know a little bit how to use this plot. I'm sure that you didn't forget everything entirely. So 20 degrees Celsius, we t follow the line up and over to 0 0.015. This vertical axis has units, we'll call it psi, humidity. Humidity has units of kilograms water. The units don't cancel per kilograms of air. And I call it psi, um, some textbooks will call it H. I'm preferring to avoid H because H is often related to enthalpy. Um, so let's move away from H, just use a, a different symbol psi throughout this section. Okay, and the reason why we go all the way up to the top is the most amount of moisture that we can hold is at this line where we've got 100 relative humidity. So percentage humidity that you see up there is the same as relative humidity. Those are identical terms, percentage humidity, relative humidity. Okay, so as we go to higher and higher temperatures, that air can hold a greater amount of moisture. Let's look at a little, um, some, more, some more terminology here. The first one is the dry bulb temperature. So when we plot psi here on the vertical axis on the prior plot, this horizontal axis is the dry bulb temperature. Okay, so we'll, we'll refer that to T, TdB. Humidity then psi is the mass of water per kilogram of dry air. And when we go to the maximum amount of water that air can hold at a given temperature, we have the value of psi s. So psi s then is essentially the number, where's my, 
my point is, so psi s is the numbers that are along that last curve over there gives you psi s. And then the percentage humidity or relative humidity is the ratio of those two numbers. So RH um, is just psi over psi s. Percentage humidity, relative humidity. Now there's a relationship between this humidity amount, psi, kilograms of water per kilograms of dry air, and partial pressure. So that's psi, PA is the lowercase p is the partial pressure. Okay, remember partial pressure is the mole fraction of moisture in the air times the total pressure. So another way of saying that is the mole fraction, um, let me, yeah, mole fraction x times the total pressure, p total, or just what I've called here capital P, so I'll just use capital P to be consistent, but it's the total pressure. So you can quickly see here, if you look at this first equation, kilograms of water per kilogram of air, you could just convert these to get a mole fraction going over there, and you can derive this formula shown here. It's, that's all, there's no magic here. This, it's not a correlation, even though these numbers look like they could come from that. See the molar mass of water, the molar mass of air in there, and that's just taking that same ratio and just converting it to a mole fraction multiplying by the total pressure. So we see exactly what we said there earlier. We said that partial pressure is high so partial pressure is high when relative humidity or just humidity is high. Okay? When we talk about relative humidity and humidity, we can often get exactly the same answer because relative humidity is the ratio of these two numbers, but the denominator stays fixed. So psi s stays fixed. So partial pressure is high when humidity is high. I'm going to write it that way. Or the other way around. If humidity is high, partial pressure is high. It's, we can see that there in the equation. If partial pressure, this number goes up. You get a higher partial pressure of water in the air. That's a numerator as a larger value. Your denominator as a whole decreases. So a larger value divided by a smaller value, humidity goes up. Okay. Or, the, or the other way around. So it's not a clear linear relationship at all but it, it indicates that intuitive understanding that a very moist body of air um, has a high partial pressure. Anything unclear with that terminology so far? This is all just recap just for now. But it's quite okay if you haven't re remembered all these details from second year, third year. Okay, so Let's just uh, do a quick calculation and dew point is another terminology, a piece of terminology that we need to understand. And that says if we take a body of air, so I'm going to take just, can take it as a basis one kilogram of moist air. So I, I take that, put it in a, in a sealed container, and we're currently at 65 degrees. So if I know, I know that point over there, I'm at 65, I know how much moisture is in my air at that particular box. I start off at that location, and then I close that system up and I cool it down. So no moisture can leave, it's a closed system. And I cool it down, I'll start to get droplets forming on the edge of that, that container. And the point at which that will happen is my dew point, 25 degrees Celsius in this case. Okay, so you simply, you're, you're starting at this point, move horizontally till you bump into the 100% um, relative humidity line. And whatever that temperature is on the horizontal axis gives you your dew point. Dew point is going to become important for us 
when we look at drying calculations later on. So we, we need to know how to move between that. And notice that at this, as I cool that body of air down, the amount of moisture stays exactly the same. I still have 0, 0.0, um, uh, I'm at 0 0.021 kilograms of water. This is cut off over here per kilogram of, of air. Okay, and then we've got one, um, one more. Oh, I see what's happened. Okay, it, it wasn't quite cut off. My screen was zoomed in. So 0 0.0021 kilograms of water per kilogram of dry air. The last uh, piece of terminology to look at is humid heat. Humid heat um, can be understood in a similar way. So again, if I take one kilogram of moist air, um, Humid heat is the equivalent of heat capacity. Heat capacity heat capacity for any sort of material, solid or, or liquid or vapor, tells you how much heat must be added to raise the temperature of that system by one degree Celsius. Well, if you've got one kilogram of moist air, you can consider that some fraction of this is, is moisture and some fraction of this is dry air. Okay, and if we want to raise that entire system by one degree Celsius, the amount of energy to do so is going to be the heat capacity of the dry air plus the heat capacity of the moist air with a ratio to account for how much of that is moisture and how much is dry air. Well, it's, it's fairly simple there. So the 1.005 comes from the heat capacity of dry air. The 1.88 number is the heat capacity of water vapor. So notice that's vapor. It's not liquid. Heat capacity of water is, is a fairly small number of water vapor. Um, and so that's 1.88. And then the psi is to make it balance out there for the accounting for the moisture percentage. So CS then is... A heat capacity for the blend of the air and water and that number is also going to be important for us because when we dry material as I said we have to heat it right? and when we heat stuff we need to know how much energy to provide to raise it by by a certain amount okay so the next terminology that we'll look at I'll start this one tomorrow is the adiabatic saturation temperature and that explains the diagonal lines on the in the diagram in front of you so what I'd like you to, um, to do for Wednesday's class is just to bring these, these graphs back with you again. Okay, so we're going to keep studying these graphs and we'll get to a case study of using this all tomorrow.